Insightful Podcasts by Informative Hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is the wrong camera angle. I'm like, That's the one I want. It, why is it just me? <laughs> this is episode 72. Oh. Uh, resetting the mountain, erasing the saga. I'm your host, uh, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and beautiful co host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. Uh, how are you doing today? Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> Happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. Nice headgear you have Thank there. Thank you. I, I, I'm i glad Captain to be themed America in and Captain America, Peggy, Peggy shirt. Carter shirt. You know, nice. So we're very nice. Very patriotic today. Uh, it is worth mentioning uh, an apology from last week. We did not get a chance to record a podcast last week. Yeah. Uh, real life crept up on us there. <sighs> you had some uh, work mm-hmm. stuff to take care of, and then I had work emergencies all weekend that i was yeah going it was back just worth the office yeah it was just one of those all right i guess we're taking a break this week <laughs> yeah yeah so kind of a kind of a rough week we do have another plan week uh coming up the weekend of the 24th we actually will not be doing a podcast because we'll be doing some renovations to the studio this will all be different Kinda, it'll it'll all be the same, but the tiles will be <laughs> shift a little bit, and we'll have, right. hopefully have new cameras. <laughs> right, right. So we're taking that weekend to uh, as a vacation from yeah, work that's too. Our, that's our our four day vacation. Woo! To redo the uh, studio. So so uh, anyway, hopefully we'll be back uh, the following week with uh, a new setup, uh, new cameras, and new hosts. No. New hosts. Why are we getting fired? I don't know. I'm going to have to ask for more money. Double my salary. Double zeros. Double zeros. I was going to say, we don't get paid anything. So as a result of our absence last week, we do have uh, quite a packed show today. Yeah, because a a bunch of the stories. It was stuff where, you know, it was worth mentioning. It was worth talking about since we didn't get a chance to to talk about it as it, it happened. Normally, we're pretty timely in what we discuss. It's stuff that, you know, popped up during the week. So... You know, a lot of stuff had happened last week that... We're timely, like Marvel. Yes. Do you get the reference? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. No, really, do you get it? What do you mean? Marvel was originally called Timely Comics. Oh, no, I did Uh not. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Little, little... Wow! Yeah, that, on the on the little fly that was that yeah, was good see? yeah so it, it was there were things that you know we had brought up once before didn't want to just you know throw out the stories and and not talk about them so right. um you know so some of the things you know if you do listen to us you know each week you might be like well wait a second this happened you know two weeks ago why are you talking about it now and it's because we wanted to to still bring them up because it was important, and we wanted to talk about important things. Right, because Disney yeah, was really, really we, yeah, no. We, we don't talk uh, about too many yeah, important things here. Anyway. <laughs> this is fun so, stuff, so. Yeah. Yes, today, if you want important stuff, listen to uh, Insights Into Tomorrow. That's where we talk about the important, controversial stuff. Once a month. Once a month. Because <laughs> that's all I can take. It. <laughs> it's very timely. Once a month. Uh, so today in Disney detective, we're going to talk about, uh, some changes to splash mountain that Disney announced, uh, Disneyland is delaying their planned previously planned July 17th reopening. Uh, Disney also wins a lawsuit over a battle for their fast passes. Then in our star Wars detective, uh, star Wars, I guess that's not detectives, right? I'm not a detective. 
Yeah. Star I don't know, Wars, what would that be? Star Wars. Star Inside. Wars Smugglers. Ooh. It's the Smugglers Run. Ooh. I think we just renamed our, our That's Star That's a War. whole podcast right there. Is yeah, what that yeah. Is. Okay. Actually, it is a podcast. So. I know. I uh, so in Star Wars Insights, uh, we'll talk about Mark Hamill and the various voice parts and other parts that he's played besides Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars saga. Uh, then there's a new book out that hints that um, only one Jedi could have stopped the Empire. And we'll talk about that briefly. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to the wild rumors that Disney might erase the sequel trilogy. Hmm. hmm. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> I see some alternate universe stuff going mm -hmm. on there. Yep. In our entertainment news, we will talk about uh, Andrew, uh, Avengers Endgame uh, and uh, someone from the MCU who will not be appearing in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, seasons of Seven, which I think is the last season, isn't yes, it? Yes, this is their last season. This is the final season. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, then a Disney World rival isn't likely to cancel their Halloween Horror Nights, even though Disney has canceled their Halloween parties. Uh -huh. And then we will finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Uh, so, busy show today. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ready to go? Sure. All right. Go for Disney Detective. Uh, so this was news that we weren't really surprised about, um, but Disney actually made the announcement that they are going to overhaul the Splash Mountain rides for uh, Disneyland in California and Walt Disney World in Florida. Um, basically, you know, if you've been reading the news Obviously, there's a lot going on in, in the country, just, um, you know, different things that have been um, trying not to get political here, um, you know, uh, terminology, you know, being used, you know, people are starting to finally realize that, um, you know, certain things need, need to change. We're finally in you know, a, a place now where it's not acceptable to to call things certain things or use certain terminology and, and whatnot. Um, so Splash Mountain, you know, as we've talked about before, um, is based off of the 1946 movie Song of the South, which depicts you know, uh, slavery and it's, you know, during the, the Civil War and it's a plantation and, and things like that. And, um, you know, it's a movie that at the time, you know, it was songs and, and cartoons and whatnot. Um, and most people, honestly, that go on the ride don't really even know anything about the movie because the majority of the people have never seen the movie because it, it's pretty much been banned. It, you know, it, it uh, most people that have a copy of it have some sort of bootleg of it um, because Disney's never released it, it never came out of the vault. Um, you know, but everybody knows the song Zippity Doo Dah and, and knows some of the characters, but they don't really know the whole story behind it. So obviously, with everything going on with Black Lives Matter and 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 whatnot there were so many different petitions to come about saying, you know, you need to change this ride. Now, I don't know if Disney, if it happened just because of all this outcry, it, it might have. But, you know, the other thing is, this isn't the first time that Disney has gone in and reimagined a ride or a ride that had been around for, for years. Now, Splash Mountain has actually only been around in the parks since 1989. So it's really not that old of a ride in, in you know, in, in Disney lifetime, I guess you can say. But again, it's not the first time that a ride has been reimagined. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in, in, in Florida became the Winnie the Pooh adventure. Uh, Snow White's ride, they, they actually got rid of it. It became, um, a, a character meet and greet. Uh, Alien Encounter became Stitch's Great Escape. Dream Flight became Buzz Lightyear's, uh, Space Ranger Spin. So they, they change rides 
you know, every couple of years, you know, anyway. So it's really not that big of a deal. You have, you know, Princess and the Frog, who it was a very popular movie. And now they kind of want to bring those characters into the park. You know, is it a, you know, a timing thing? Because, you know, you had guests and fans of Disney that, you know, said, hey, now's the time to do it. You know, or was it something that was already in the works? You, you know, you don't know. Now, you you know, there's stories coming out of, um, you know, different uh, the, the Redskins. You know, now they're looking at changing their name or the Cleveland Indians. They're looking at changing, you know, their name, too. So, again, is it part of the awakening right. of the country or was it something that, you know, Disney was already kind of feeling and I know when you know we talked about it a couple of weeks ago you know you had said do some education you know don't change the ride leave it the way it is but have some educational information to to show people you know the the history behind it you know and I'm sure you know they they don't just come up with one idea and go with that idea we know from watching various um documentaries and things there's you know millions of ideas that they throw out on the table to try and figure out what the best solution is for for something or or well, best and, idea and that's the thing taking taking the whole thing into perspective it was 89 that the ride went in mm -hmm. well in 89 song of the south was already persona non grata mm -hmm. as far as disney yeah so the fact that they would be so tone deaf as to create a ride themed after a movie that they themselves mm -hmm. did not want to distribute because of the controversy around it seems kind of silly. Mm. Um, but outside of that, I can't imagine that this change is part of their long-term roadmap. Mm -hmm. This is a reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. Um what it tells me is that Disney today is far more sensitive to these racial issues than they were back in 89. Mm -hmm. Cause in 89, they would not have come up with a ride that was themed after that movie, but they're willing to make changes now to try to make amends for those things. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're doing is basically erasing what was a mistake on their part, mm -hmm. which is one way of dealing with it. I still think that there's a lost opportunity here mm -hmm. because the things that that occurred in that movie, while they were probably glorifying some of the wrong things, right? there was a cultural heritage that emerged from that movie right. that was very deeply rooted in African-American folklore mm -hmm. and stories and stuff like that. And you're losing that now. Right. So we're pulling all of that out where instead we could have capitalized on mm -hmm. that. We could have turned the whole thing into a learning experience and turned a negative experience into a positive one mm -hmm. and help to promote that cultural diversity. And instead, you know, Disney just, you know, pulled a mulligan and just said, all right, that's it. We're done. And we're going right, to put right. something else in. It's one way to solve the problem. I don't know if it's the best way to do it, mm -hmm. but doing nothing was the wrong thing. And I could totally see them, you know, now having Disney Plus, um, you know, a as an outlet. I could totally see somebody doing some sort of educational documentary, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and especially gears towards, you know, younger kids, you know, and you, you see that, you know, with various things going on in the world, how news outlets, um, you know, when the coronavirus happened and, and everything that was going on, there were a couple of different news outlets that, you know, did special programs for kids so that they could understand it. And it also helped for parents who didn't know how to explain what was going on to, to their children. So I could totally see Disney coming out and saying, you know, yes, we're changing it because of this, but this is why, and this is, you know, what the film was about. And like you said, you know, show the positives of it. Cause right. there, you know, there were positive aspects, you know, to it. It wasn't, you know, like, Hey, this is great that we have slaves, you know, 
type thing. You right, know, no, I mean, there was there was it was these these stories and these songs mm-hmm. that were the the binding inspiration mm-hmm. when you were in bondage. Right. You know, uh, the the uh, Jewish culture is based on the same type mm-hmm. of thing. It's yeah. those stories that are passed down. Right. That hold – that's what your your entire society is based on. Mm-hmm. Your entire culture is based on those things. Right, right. And these things were in the movie, but they were de-emphasized in the movie for other things. Mm-hmm. That's what they should be focusing on. Right. Um, I hope – you know, I'm glad that Disney's doing something to try to, you know, make amends for mm-hmm. that, that mistake. I hope they don't stop there. Right. There's a great opportunity. There's a there's a tremendous learning potential here mm-hmm. where they can go to that next level and do even more. And mm-hmm. hopefully they will do that. Yeah. Uh, they won't be doing it at Disneyland, at least not before uh, they can reopen <sighs> there. And apparently July 17th, they're not going to be reopening. Tell us about that one. Yeah. As of right now, um, there's they were planning to uh, – for. California, Disneyland in California to actually open on July 17th. But as of right now, that is possibly postponed. Um, word had come out that uh, they didn't actually have the the green light from the state of California uh, to open up. And it seems that California will provide reopening guidelines for theme parks after July 4th. So I'm guessing probably on Monday, uh, some more information will will come out. Um, so, you know, Disney had tweeted that we have no choice but to de- to delay the reopening of our theme parks and resort hotels until we receive approval from government officials. Once we have a clearer understanding of when guidelines will be released, we expect to be able to communicate a reopening date. Uh, Disneyland had announced about three weeks ago that they were going to be reopening on July 17th, which is actually the park's 65th anniversary. Um, so as of right now, everything is kind of on hold. Uh, Downtown Disney, uh, their opening was supposed to be on July 9th, and then the uh, parks were going to be opening on the 17th, and then the hotels were going to start opening on July 23rd. So as of right now... They're kind of in a, a holding pattern, waiting to to hear, um, you know, when they can reopen. Well, and given the the number of states that are seeing surges mm-hmm. in COVID nineteen numbers, yeah. it's probably for the best at this mm-hmm. point in time. I think I think California made the right call there. That, mm-hmm. You know, let's hold off and wait and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it stinks that they're going to miss the anniversary, but better be safe than sorry. And usually, you know, their anniversaries are celebrated for over a year. True. So that while it true. would be nice to have something on that specific day, again, d- given, the, given the current circumstances, better to, to wait it out. Tell us about the latest lawsuit that is uh disney's hit with yeah so six years after first being sued over its disabilities access service card policy disney has now officially won a case in federal court a judge ruled that disney does not have to grant immediate or unlimited access to rides at its theme park instead Disney's preferred alternative of giving those with disabilities return times is acceptable. So the lawsuit was actually filed back in 2014 by um, Donna Lorman. Uh, She's the head of the Autism Society of Greater Orlando, and she's the mother of an adult son with autism. She had reportedly asked for 10 fast passes to enter the Magic Kingdom rides without having to wait in line. She said her son has trouble understanding the concept of time. And Disney pushed back and said that, you know, they could have three fast passes, which is the current rule, um, just like everybody else. And that once she had used her three fast passes, she could try and book more, um, you know, for the rest of the time. Um, So because, you know, she didn't want to have to wait in line, uh, she filed the lawsuit. Um, So the case is the first of many similar ones that were brought against Disney following a change to its policy around access back in 2013. And for those of you who don't know, this was a big scandal that kind of came out at the time. Um, So previously, the company allowed those with a guest assistance card and their 
their family to enter any fast pass line they wanted for unlimited amount of times. Unfortunately, the system produced a lot of unintended consequences. According to uh, the Orlando Sentinel, people began, began producing counterfeit passes, and some people with disabilities were caught offering their services services to guess at a fee in order to skip the line. So you could go online and basically rent a disabled person who lived in the area and go, you know, go to Disney and basically ride all the rides without, you know, any wait. So web start, uh, websites started detailing the exact steps people needed in order to, you know, to lie and be given a card. And the wait times, you know, increased throughout the park because you had so many people that were abusing it. Um, you know, there were even travel agents that were telling you, you know, what you needed to do or, oh, go to your doctor and get this note so you can get this card. And really, it was a shame because there were people that, you know, needed to, to have this, uh, you know, uh, uh, accessibility to to the rides and stuff and because people were you know were faking the system disney basically did away with it um so during the trial you know they were saying that you know the average person with a guest assistance card could go on you know one of the more popular rides toy, St- toy story mania like 10 times where the average person waits two hours to go on the ride um So the U.S. district judge ultimately ruled that Disney did not have to give, you know, this woman son special access uh, and that it was unreasonable for such accommodations to be expected and said Disney can pursue a judgment for its legal fees if it chooses. And, you know, basically came out and said, no, we don't have to let you get on, you know, all the rides, because if we do that, wait times for everybody else is going to go up um you know as somebody who's been to disney multiple times back in the day you know when my father was around and he had disability issues disney is probably one of you know a few places that actually looks out for those people they want you to come they want you to have an enjoyable experience but you don't want to take advantage of it either and unfortunately that's what you know many people did and and took advantage of of this system so you know now it it, you know and and you have to think about it if you were to go to you know six flags how many rides are handicap accessible how many rides you know do they take their time to help you you know get on or, or you know slow the ride down so you can get on it or have special you know uh seats for people to get on you know as somebody that's been to disney as many times as you have now you've seen yeah what disney does you know you know disney goes out of its way to try to provide the best experience possible Mm -hmm. for people who require additional access Mm -hmm. um and the expectation people have that disney should do more is totally unrealistic the Mm -hmm. fact that your first response is to sue for this right i think is almost borderline juvenile Mm -hmm. to be honest with you like i want to take my ball and go home right right however disney is not blame free for here Mm -hmm. you know disney created this problem right because of how they pack their parks Mm -hmm. they don't cap the number of people in the parks right they don't manage their queues effectively their mm-hmm. idea is well let's pack as many people into a queue as we can well not now <laughs> and let's turn the queues themselves into an attraction into an attraction to get, and like, right like that philosophy is is terrible to me if anything you should be cutting down the, the mm-hmm. size of the queues right so people aren't waiting in line that long giving people other things to do other than wait in line you know, there's an entire strategy when you go to Disney of how to manage the queues mm-hmm. yeah you know don't Go to fireworks. Don't go to parades. That's the time to go to the, you know, get online for the stuff that you want to get on. Right, right. Take advantage of the extra magic hours. There's all these things that you can do. Mm -hmm. The problem is is that Disney puts in these kind of halfway solutions Mm -hmm. and then people use those to game the system. Right. Um, So Disney kind of keeps manifesting these problems themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's definitely problems on both sides of it. Um 
but I, you know, as much as it pains me to say so, I side with Disney on this mm-hmm. one where they don't have an obligation to do that. Disney's already going out of their way. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's ride accessibility, whether it's uh, accommodations at the resorts, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, catering to people with special dietary needs, mm-hmm. you can't get that level of service anywhere yeah. else the the buses the transportation absolutely you know they they do you know and i've seen how it's changed because you know a, as i've mentioned before i don't know if i've mentioned it on the podcast or not but like when i had gone with my my parents back then the buses weren't handicap accessible so if you needed transportation you had to call and get a special van to come and and pick you up, you know, if you were a resort yeah. guest. And sometimes it could take up to an hour to to get it. Where now, every bus, you know, is handicap accessible. The monorails at the time weren't all handicap accessible. Now they they all are. Again, a lot of the ride uh, vehicles for you know a lot of the rides have some sort of handicap accessible. Uh, version of it so they definitely throughout the years have gone above and beyond disney you know you can't criticize disney for their accessibility they do a better job at that than any other company in the world Mm -hmm. so people need to back off and and deal with it right and 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 if you can't game the system right and if you can't get on every ride oh well enjoy you know your time that that you're there absolutely absolutely So that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm -hmm. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back with our Star Wars insights. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Star Wars Insights. So during the season finale of uh, Disney Gallery, The Mandalorian, it was revealed that Mark Hamill had a vocal cameo as droid EV-99 in the series, um, which I didn't know about until uh, we saw that. Um, And the actor was actually confirming on social media that he had vocal cameos in all the Star Wars films from Disney and most recently uh, revealed that his secret uh, pseudonym for Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, and Solo, A Star Wars Story, was William M. Patrick. The actor didn't reveal which characters he actually voiced, um, as the credits only appear in uh, the additional voices section of the credits. Uh, But fans, you know, uh, were very happy to see that. And he had actually tweeted that it was never about billing or salary. Um, It was all for fun and the fans. And because I love Easter eggs, I uh, misremembered my pseudonym as Patrick William. It was actually William M. Patrick uh, for my older brother and my younger brother. But I'm not telling you what the M stands for. Hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So I thought that was kind of a a cute little uh, story to to throw in that, you know, that's cool. And that's typical that he's been part of. It's, All the Disney movie, yeah, you know, Disney Star of Wars Mark movies. Mark Hamill because yeah. Mark Hamill is such a good sport. Mm-hmm. He totally loves the fans. Yeah, yeah, and and he loves the saga. Mm-hmm. You know, he yeah. is a Star Wars fan himself. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're very fortunate to to have him, you know, as part of 
you know, this heritage of Star Wars. Yeah, so it kind of reminds me almost of um, John Ratzenberg, how he's in every Pixar movie. He's right. been in every Pixar movie that's ever happened. So he's either had a main character or just, char- you know, done one voice. And now Mark Hamill has kind of done that with anything Star Wars, you know, right. since Disney took it over. So kind of nice. cool. Very nice. Mm-hmm. So tell us about the only Jedi who could have stopped the Empire. So while Qui-Gon only appeared in one Star Wars film, he still is one of the most influential characters to ever appear in the franchise. As a recent hint from the new Star Wars book seems to indicate he was actually the only Jedi with the ability to stop Palpatine's wicked scheme. So the new book uh, that came out is The Queen's Peril, and it basically supports this whole theory. Um, and it says that it seems that Qui-Gon sensed that there was something odd about the legislation that was going on. And he and Obi- Obi-Wan were actually looking through every detail in order to figure it out. And no doubt that this explains why Qui-Gon, uh, Qui-Gon was the Jedi sent to Naboo when the Trade Federation invaded and that he was already familiar with the different issues that were going on. So it kind of becomes clear that Qui-Gon was a very unique Jedi and that he was the only member of the old Jedi Order sensitive enough with the living force to understand what was coming and that he knew enough to be watching out for the political affairs with real concern. And it was unclear whether or not Palpatine truly understood the scale of Qui-Gon's threat or whether it was just his good fortune that Darth Maul, you know, cut him up, uh, you know, in, in front of Obi-Wan. So. He's such a cut up, isn't he? <laughs> well, and it's also, you know, convenient how in Attack of the Clones, mm-hmm. Qui-Gon's master turns out to be the next Sith apprentice. Right. So it all sort of fits together like a nice little puzzle right right and and dave filoni had actually said that you know that duel of the fates was actually you know the or the the scene between qui-gon and and darth maul you know was his most favorite and that he argues that had qui-gon won that duel that he would have probably been able to save the soul of anakin skywalker that maybe palpatine knew he had to, you know. It's all Obi Wan's fault because he got stuck behind the door. Right. So if he was there, they would have won. Exactly. Uh, but it wouldn't have mattered because <laughs> Disney gonna... <laughs> might be erasing the sequel trilogies anyway. Tell us about that. So one. this is obviously a very far fetched rumor. You know, nothing is confirmed. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, so obviously, Rise of Skywalker ended. You know, the the final trilogy, you know, sort of, kind of. And obviously with Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, you know, the whole, that trilogy kind of, <laughs> you know, as you've gone off on tangents, you and Sam have gone off on tangents, it was obviously... Not Terrible. your favorite. Yeah. So so enter YouTuber Overlord DVD, who previously got a hold of some accurate Rise of Skywalker spoilers. And in a video, he claims that Disney is going to scrub the sequel trilogy from canon and basically kind of make it its an alternate universe. Um, he had said that, you know, Lucasfilm realizes that they have a massive problem on their hands and that the Star Wars franchise is all but dead. Well, obviously, we know that the Star Wars franchise is not all from dead because look at everything that is coming to Disney+. Plus. Um, you know, and so far what's been successful you have the mandalorian um very successful obviously the obi-wan show is supposed to be coming and uh the cassie and andor show and then obviously we know that the new star wars film uh being directed by uh taiki waititi is gonna probably be you murder that man i know every i'm time sorry i try it. not to <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on. Um, you know, that he's such a fan, you know, and, and you saw it in, in the Mandalorian special, how much of a love he has for it and everything that he's been working on so far has been phenomenal. So, you know, it's 
it's not going to suck. Um, but what's kind of interesting is, is this talks about how, you know, there were all these like plot twists and things like that. And, you know, I didn't watch Star Wars Rebels. You did. But I guess there was something, the veil of the force. So what they're saying, you know, what he explained is that Emperor Palpatine had a room on the second Death Star called the Room of Mirrors and that the mirrors were created by the Emperor uh, prior to the Death Star going through the dark side using ancient Sith rituals and that these mirrors were linked to the Veil of Force and served many purposes. And by using them, Palpat Palpatine could manipulate the Force in many ways to further his aims. And for example, the use of the mirrors allowed pa Palpatine to cloud the uh, Jedi Council to conceal himself and his dark apprentices from the Jedi and from Force sensitives that followed, you know, their fall. So they're kind of alluding to the fact that they're going to use this whole you know, room of mirrors and the veil of the force to kind of say, oh, everything was like alternate universe and it didn't really happen. And and the way that, you know, veil of force played out in uh, Rebels, you could probably get away with that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of akin to J.J. Uh, Abrams bringing Star Trek back. Okay. But satisfying all the fans by it being in its own separate timeline. Mm -hmm. So. Everything that happened with the original stuff still happened, and right. then this happened off on its own little world. Right. Uh, so this is kind of like their safe little sandbox that they might be able mm. to stick this in, which if they do that, it's kind of lame because you still don't <laughs> – well, because you don't have your original cast at that point in time to right. do anything with. Right. They're, they're getting old. Right. So you can't – unless you're going to – and there have been rumors of this – Unless you're going to relaunch the franchise with those characters played by different people. Different people, right. Which I think is an absolute mistake. Mm. But should they decide to section this off as alternate universe, what do you do about Leia? Right. You know, you, you can't go back and do reshoots at this point. Nope. So if they go that route, I think they're really going to kind of, you know, pigeonhole themselves at that point and what they can do with what the fans really wanted. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a difficult position to be in. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, yeah, and again, this is all this rumor. This is very likely a, a, a disgruntled fan like me Absolutely. desperately trying to find trying a way to out of this mess something. that yeah. Ryan Johnson left us in. Yeah, basically. Uh, because I, I can't blame J.J. Abrams. Force Awakens was a viable movie mm -hmm. in which to start the franchise with. Right. And then Ryan Johnson came in and just killed the entire thing. And yet, Disney's still talking about giving him another trilogy. Yeah. I don't know. Which, you know, if the kid burned the house down once, you don't give him any more matches. <laughs> anyway, that was it for our Star Wars Insider. Yep. Uh, we will be back in a moment with our entertainment news. Okay. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. So tell us who from the MCU will not be in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. 
So with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. winding down on ABC, fans were wondering if any of the show's characters would make their way into from the movies. Um, So obviously Marvel films and, you know, the cinematic universe have have kind of had, you know, some crossovers here and there. Um, So as we mentioned, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., this is their final season. um, And we were hoping that some, you know, Big actors, maybe from the movies, were going to be making their way uh, into uh, the some of the episodes. Um, but it seems that one actor basically came out and said, "Nope, sorry, not going to be coming." Um, and the final season, if you haven't been watching it, is really based on time travel. They're they're hopping around uh, different errors of of the marvel universe um you know basically the the start of shield and kind of the middle of shield and you know where they're going to go to um you know so are we going to see some sort of crossover where you know colson was first killed by loki in you know the avengers um but one of the actors that did kind of show up um was the character of daniel susa who was in uh, uh, Agent Carter, uh, the the series that had come out, um, and people were hoping that maybe Agent Carter herself was going to show up because I know as we were watching it, we were going, "Oh, this is be perfect. Peggy can come," and uh, you know she actually did the the actress who who plays her. Um, actually, uh, Haley Atwell had actually come out and said, nope, sorry, I won't be, you know, showing up. But thanks, you know, thanks for thinking of me and hoping. Um, because again, when we saw the, the time period that they had, you know, jumped into, we were like, oh, Peggy's alive. She has to be here. She's a member of S.H.I.E.L.D. And what was really funny, um, you know, was one of the characters on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was pretending to be Peggy Carter because she knew, you know, oh, she, she everybody knows who she is but they might not know that i you know i'm not her but i have a british accent so it'll totally work um so it was kind of you know disappointing to you know see peggy not show up but it was nice that she was referenced yeah. you know uh, yeah that so is a far. shame she was definitely uh and still is one of our favorite characters from mm-hmm. marvel i think her uh her show was fantastic her mm-hmm. appearances in uh the uh avengers and uh, mm-hmm. captain america movies you know mm-hmm. we absolutely love her she uh she i think represents exactly the kind of role model that i think mm-hmm. young girls like our daughter need mm-hmm. today yeah absolutely um, so any chance to get more of her on mm-hmm. screen i think is is a welcome thing yeah and just as a side note you know i've been watching agents of shield since the beginning i, I did kind of miss part of i don't remember which season it was because i like kind of started watching it and then i stopped watching it and then i kind of went back into it and you kind of didn't get into it then you went back and and caught up and we've been watching it now together you know for for a while and honestly this has probably been my most favorite season out of it and i think because of the kitschiness of it and all the throwback stuff that they're doing and and the time hop you know you know they they did like the 50s and then they did the 70s and it was just the intro to the 70s well that's the thing had us with with almost each episode they're theming the intro mm-hmm. to the time period right. of the style the right. TV shows were done, and it's, in. And it's, it's like you go from the noir, you know, right, detective, uh, the detective thirties type mm-hmm. style up to like you know, eventually you culminate in the seventies, right, with, right, you know, the Wonder Woman feel, right, you know? right, right. So just, you know, if, if you watched, throwback. yeah, if you watched any of the seasons, and you know, please give this one you know some love it, it's definitely you know worth it yeah so tell us about disney world's rivals uh, not canceling their 
Halloween. Stuff. Yeah, so we had reported that, you know, Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween party had been canceled because, you know, they have a special parade, they do special fireworks, there's special meet and greets, and those are all things that once the park opens, they're not going to be doing. Um, but it seems that uh, Universal Orlando has not decided as of yet to cancel their Halloween uh, Horror Nights. Now, obviously, their Halloween party is much different um, than than that of Disney. Um, One thing is that um, Disney usually starts their Halloween party in August um, because of how many guests, you know, want to go to it, where Halloween Horror Nights actually usually don't start until um, the end of September. So it's a much shorter season um, that they do it. Plus, um, they do shows, but all of their shows are set in a theater. So right now, um, Universal Orlando has has already reopened. So they're already doing a lot of the social distancing. Um, you know, so right now for their shows, they are doing... Uh, shows at at Universal, but they have, you know, people spaced out and and whatnot. So for the shows for the Halloween party, they'd be able to have them um, spread out. One of the other things that um, happens during uh, Halloween Horror Nights is they have a lot of walkthrough horror attractions, um, you know, haunted house type things. So now the plan is that they'd still be able to do those. They just have to space people out a lot more, you know, where maybe they would send in a group of 20 at a time. Now they're only going to send in, you know, if you're a party of four, you go in and space out. Um, You know, and obviously the actors that, you know, maybe came in contact with you might not be as close to coming in contact with you, you know, as before, Um, not as much interaction with them. So as of right now, their plan is to still, you know, continue with it. Because the other thing, too, it's an additional ticket price. It's not included in your regular admission. So they can monitor how many people would get um you know, would be purchasing a, a, a ticket for it. So they can kind of cap it off at, at a certain amount of, of people, um, you know, without, you know, Disney doing it, that's, you know, $135 a ticket, you know, that Disney is losing out on. Obviously, Universal wants to try and, you know, make as much, you know, as they can because they've been, you know, closed, you know, as long. And and obviously with uh, Universal, they're part of Comcast. Disney obviously is Disney, ABC. So, Disney's you know, everything else. Disney is everything else. So, you know, it's just another branch of, you know, this conglomerate of, of each you know and, and you know what i don't i certainly don't blame them for wanting to do this the timing i think is critical for mm-hmm. them because it's it's much further out right right um they've they're already going to have controls in place mm-hmm. for it so hopefully yeah. it will be safe mm-hmm. um you know I, I i can certainly sympathize for the need for um businesses to, to mm-hmm. get back to some sense of normal right right I mean, you've got you know franchises and everything that are going out of business at this mm-hmm. point because of how tough they're being hit economically. Yeah. But from a citizen standpoint, everyone needs some sense of normalcy at this point in time. And you, and need, you need something to, to look forward to. Right. And you need to, but you need to do it smartly. Absolutely. And you need to do it safely. Mm-hmm. Um, there's really no point in getting back to normal if it means killing people. Right. So, so hopefully this is a good yeah. move for them and, yeah. and they can do it safely and smartly. Mm-hmm. That was all we had for entertainment news. Yep. We'll be right back with our insightful picks. Okay. Go for your insightful pick. Uh, so my insightful pick is uh, a Netflix documentary um, that actually originally um, was released on ABC uh, back in 2019. This version is a little bit more extended and... Um, 
language was allowed to be uh, used, where obviously when it uh, appeared on network television, they kind of took all that stuff out. And it is called The Show Must Go On, The Queen and Adam Lambert Story. Um, So you get to see rare footage and candid interviews in this documentary that details the pairing of the legendary rock band Queen and Adam Lambert kind of coming up and, you know, getting together with them to become, you know, their their new lead singer. Um, so it's a two hour documentary that follows uh, Queen's Brian May and Roger Taylor, plus singer Adam Lambert in their incredible collaboration uh, of the last decade. Um, it features rare co- uh, concert footage, interviews with the, t- uh, the trio, Adam's parents, uh, Simon Cowell, um, and even Bohemian Rhapsody's... Uh, uh, Rami, Rami uh, Malik, who played Freddie Mercury in, in the movie, um, as well as other um, celebrity uh, rock stars and uh, other um, journalists, you know, who have basically followed Queen, you know, from the beginning up until now. Um, and it, it's very interesting because it gives you, you know, kind of the, the background of where Queen was, you know, after, you know, Freddie Mercury, you know, announced that he was sick and then his passing and, you know, how Queen kind of evolved, you know, from there and never really went away, but kind of showed up and, you know, various people that that uh, came and and tried to be the lead singer. You know, uh, they did one concert where they basically had like 10 different uh, celebrities kind of fill in because Freddie Mercury was just such a charismatic and unique singer that he could do all those 10 styles. You know, he didn't need to, you know, he could be those 10 different people. Um, and it basically shows, you know, we remember seeing Adam Lambert on American Idol. We remember, you know, watching him and, you know, each week he, did something completely different and, you know, and they show you, you know, his rise up, you know, through everything and that, you know, it kind of was like this perfect marriage of, of the two of them, you know, the queen and, and, and Adam Lambert coming together. And you can see that, um, you know, and, and just how he, you know, and he knows he's not replacing, you know, Freddie Mercury, he could never replace him, but he just feels so honored to be, you know, part of this. And plus, he still has his his solo career, you know, as well. So it's not like he's with them 100% of the time. It's just nice to be able to, to bring it back to the fans who never got to see Queen, um, you know, live, you know, back in the day, and the music is still as refreshing as it is, you know, today as it was you know back then so very cool cool pick thank you so my pick this week uh shocker is a documentary (gasps) uh this one kind of in honor of fourth of july is a patriotic one here and that is world war ii in hd on the history channel World War II in HD is the first ever World War II documentary presented in full immersive HD color. Culled from thousands of hours of lost and rare color archival footage gathered from a worldwide search through basements and archives, World War II in HD will change the way the world sees this defining conflict. Using footage never before seen by most Americans, converted to HD for unprecedented clarity, viewers will experience the war as if they were actually there, surrounded by the real sights and sounds of battlefields. Along the way, they'll meet a diverse group of soldiers whose wartime diaries and journals show in visceral detail that the, what the war was really like. This visually astonishing landmark series presents the story of World War II through the eyes of 12 Americans who experienced the war firsthand. Viewers will hear the story of Army nurse June Wandry, who served from the beginning of the war in North Africa to the liberation of the camps in Germany. 
They'll meet Shelby Westbrook, a young African-American from Toledo who became a member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. Jimmy Kananya, the son of Japanese immigrants who served in the U.S. Army and was imprisoned in Europe. And Jack Werner, a Jewish immigrant who escaped from Austria before the war and wound up fighting not against Hitler but the hated, and the hated Nazis, but the, in the Pacific Theater. And, you know, aside from the actual visual stunning things, I mean, one of the things that they did in, in just the opening uh, episode is they give you footage, never before seen footage from Pearl Harbor that oh, wow. was restored just for this special, which was just incredibly moving. Uh, but what they do is they bring these journals and it's a combination of the actual heroes from the war reading their journals and then they're voiced over for the for the uh, longer length of the journals by well-known actors like mm -hmm. Rob Lowe. And, right, you know, right. Gary Sinise is the narrator. Um, it's a very well done, um, very well put together and comprehensive look at the war from the perspective of the guys who were right on the mm. front lines. You know, this is not a, you know, let's follow the biography of mm -hmm. Patton or something like that. This is what it was really like. You know, these guys talk about, you know, living in the Pacific and building makeshift shelters to get out of the sun. And, mm -hmm. you know, you really see in the trenches how they actually survived. And seeing everything in color puts a whole different perspective on right, this. Right, right. Um, and it, this isn't the only only um, series that does it in color. But hearing it in the voices of the, of the men mm -hmm. that were there, um, the one interview that they do with Jack Warner, who changes his name from a very German name to mm. something that's a little more Americanized when he comes over. Okay. Because he doesn't want to have that stigma. Mm, okay. Um, he he leaves, he, he flees Europe because of the plight of the Jews under, under Nazi Germany and and comes over to America and tries to get into Hollywood, fails to get into Hollywood, and decides, well, I need to volunteer. Mm, okay. You know, and they talk about the greatest generation. Mm -hmm. And and he makes a point in the interview. He, th you know, he thinks the greatest generation is only the greatest generation if they knew what was at stake. There were a lot of people that had no idea what was at stake. He t tells a story about this one young uh a uh, soldier, he was a farmer, you know, had never seen anything outside of his hometown. And he's there in a trench with him at one point in time. And the fog of battle, you can't see anything. This guy gets shot in the head. Mm. And he had no idea what the danger was, you know. And it just, those personalized stories like that really kind of brings home the horror of of what these guys went through. So very well done documentary. World War II in HD on the History Channel. So I think that was all we had for today. Yep. Uh, before we go, I do want to invite folks to take a look at our long-form articles now published on Medium at medium.com slash insights into things. I would also invite you to subscribe to our podcast. Uh, you can get our audio podcasts uh, if you look up insights into entertainment on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else. You can get our video podcasts uh, if you look up insights into things. Uh, we're available on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash insights into things, or you can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can watch us on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv backslash insights into things. We broadcast six days a week, six days a week. Um, so you get to see some of our best ofs uh, each day. It's a, a different theme, so you can find us there. Uh, you can also catch us on Twitter. We'd love to get your feedback at insights into things, insights underscore things. Uh, on the web at www.insightsintothings.com. Or you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. Uh, on Facebook. <laughs> Facebook. Get them out of order. I'm throwing you off. <laughs> I'm like, crap, 
We did that one. We did that one. Uh, <laughs> Facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it. I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Another one in the book. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.